Before we begin, a heads up that this episode spends some time talking about suicide and reporting on suicide. Please keep this in mind if you choose to listen. A reminder that the phone number for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is 988. If you are having or know someone having suicidal thoughts, please call. It's free and confidential. Now for the episode. Hi and welcome to the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon. In each episode, we'll talk to or about an interesting person or organization related to journalism. The intent is to show that journalists are not the enemy of the people. Thank you for listening. On this episode, we're joined by Aneri Patani. She's a national correspondent for Kaiser Health News based in Raleigh, North Carolina. She's also pursuing her master's in public health at Johns Hopkins as a Bloomberg Fellow. She has a very full resume with internships, reporting, and producing work, two years now at Kaiser, and she recently won an award from INN for reporting on flawed drug treatment facilities. Aneri, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So on your LinkedIn, you note, I believe that being a journalist is akin to being a student for life and that a journalist can bring about enlightenment emotion and change. What is your journalism origin story? So my journalism origin story goes back to elementary school. Somewhere between like second, third, fourth grade, I was reading Harry Potter books and decided, you know, I love reading. I'm going to write the next Harry Potter series. And that was going to be my my career in life. But luckily, the school actually had a program where you could try out individual projects. And I sat down, tried to write a book and realized I got bored. I liked writing, but I didn't want to just sit there and and think of it on my own. I wanted to be interacting with folks. So frankly, I was just looking up like, what other jobs do people do where they write a lot and stumbled on journalism, picked it somewhat arbitrarily and uh, got pretty lucky that as I started doing and practicing journalism with clubs and and internships throughout high school and college, I really fell in love with it. You grew up in Connecticut. Was there anything within your upbringing that lent itself to telling stories? I don't know that it's it's more than anyone else, but there was certainly, you know, a lot of natural storytelling in my family. You know, my grandma used to tell us stories before bedtime. My mom, who is originally from India, would tell us about Indian history in like a very storytelling format is how I learned that. And We went to the library all the time. As I mentioned, I love to read. So I loved stories and was surrounded by them. So I think that kind of led me to want to tell them as well. And let's go back to that LinkedIn statement. I believe being a journalist is akin to being a student for life. Why do you say that? Because that's the best part of the job, in my opinion, right? The fact that I get to call people who are experts in their field or who have had very different life experiences from myself and ask them questions and get to learn about them, learn their perspectives. It is literally like being a student every single day. And that's the part of this job that I love the most. Some people would probably shy away from being a student every single day, but it's cool that you fully embrace it. Now, your LinkedIn lists 18 journalism work experiences, everything from hosting a show to producing for NYC to reporting that's appeared in the New York Times, the Texas Tribune, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Boston Globe. That's that's a very impressive group there. Can you pick maybe three work experiences that you've had and explain at each one how it played a pivotal role in your career? Sure. A little difficult because I think all I think all of the different experiences really shaped me as a reporter. And you're also catching the fact that I have not cleared out my LinkedIn since it, it was started in college. <laughs> so all of that is still on there. But I think one of the one of the most formative ones was certainly the Record Journal, which is a small newspaper in well, based in Meriden, Connecticut, and covers, you know, several local towns. And it was the first place I did a official paid internship as a journalist. And it just kind of, you know, got me the classic training of going to school board meetings and the first time I got an angry phone call from someone who read my story about how much the board was going to allocate to music education so just some of those formative journalist experiences were there. I think the second one that I would pick is probably the Texas Tribune. I did an internship there in 2016 when there was a major abortion case in front of the Supreme Court and I helped their women's health reporter cover that And that is where I got interested in health reporting specifically. Before that, I didn't know what beat I wanted to cover, but this was the first place where I kind of 
saw the connection between health policy, which always seemed like wonky and discussed by politicians, but not relevant to me. And I got to see how that impacts people's daily lives and why it's so important. And then the last one I will pick is when I worked at WNYC, which is the NPR station in New York. And I had never, I never planned to work in radio. And uh, frankly, I didn't have radio skills when they hired me. I got very lucky that I was looking for a health reporting job, my first full-time job out of college, and they were looking to build their health team. So they took a chance on me as someone having some health reporting experience and they trained me in radio. And I got to work with a lot of awesome you know, radio reporters and I got to help produce a podcast. And it just kind of opened me to a whole new world with skills that I still use. So I tell people like writing is still my first love, but I like having the ability to do audio stories and getting to get people's voices on the air that way. And I never would have considered doing any of that if it wasn't for that job. What was the first thing that you got to do that brought about enlightenment, emotion, and change? Oh, boy. I really need to take that off my website. It's uh, <laughs> too lofty a goal. No, it's, it's still the goal. I don't know if, I don't know if, if I've you know, done any story that has had you know, widespread change or the things that you know, journalists dream of. I'm, that's still my aspiration to someday have you know, that investigative piece that changes policy that leads to change. But I think one of the things I was proud of was when I was reporting in Pennsylvania, I wrote a series of stories about a, the largest community college system in Pennsylvania that was, they were essentially getting rid of their mental health services for students and getting rid of all their counselors. And they had tried to do it sort of quietly. And we were able to kind of write about it and write about the impact that was having on students. And college mental health is a topic that's really special to me and something that I like reporting on a lot. And so getting to cover that repeatedly in the fallout and what, what that was, what kind of situation that left students in led to led the um, community college system to do a partial policy reversal where they kind of reinstituted some services, not everything the students were asking for, but a little bit more than they were going to have originally. And that made me happy that they listened to what the students were saying. Certainly impactful journalism, certainly valuable. And with that, I guess we should explain your current job. You work for Kaiser Health News. What is your role for them? Yeah, so Kaiser Health News is a nonprofit newsroom where we basically cover only health and health policy. So it's, it's niche. And we have kind of a unique publishing model where everything we write goes free on our website, but can also be republished by other news outlets for free. So a lot of my articles, I mean, all of my articles go on our website, but sometimes they also publish with NPR or CNN or like local newspapers. So where I am, like the Raleigh News and Observer, and I write all sorts of health stories for them. I tend to focus mostly on mental health, addiction, and suicide related topics, just where my experiences in the past and my reporting in the past has really led me to focus. And I do a mix of, you know, written articles and radio stories. Is there a specific appeal to being in North Carolina? So my partner it goes to grad school here. He's pursuing his PhD. So when I, I was hired at Kaiser Health News during 2020, during COVID and the pandemic. And so I just, I've been working remotely and just haven't made it to our DC office yet. Gotcha. But, uh, but with that, you've certainly done coverage of things within North Carolina, I've noticed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I live here. I'm interested. It is a state with a huge healthcare presence, right? Tons of large academic hospitals, nonprofit hospitals, lots of research going on. So I think I, I didn't come here to cover that. But since I'm here, there is so much to cover. Certainly in the, in the research triangle. And you're in Raleigh, as you mentioned. Now, we always look at the recent work that reporters have done. You've done some stories as part of a series this recent that Kaiser is doing on medical debt and how it's changed people's lives and whether that's due to overwhelming costs or flaws in the billing process. How do you come up with your story ideas, whether they're connected to bigger things like that Kaiser is doing or things that you may wish to focus on? So with the medical debt series, some of that, you know, comes from other, you know, we have other reporters. My colleague, Noam Levy, is 
leading that project. And he, you know, certainly chatting with him leads me to a lot of good story ideas. But on that project also, and, and definitely generally in my own coverage, I really just find story ideas by talking to people I find interesting. So I mentioned I cover mental health and addiction often. I try to set up, you know, just what I call informational interviews, which are really just informal phone calls or coffees with like students who, college students who run mental health groups or people working at syringe service programs or people who have survived suicide attempts and literally chat with them about, you know, what stories do they see? What do they dislike in the news? What do they think news gets wrong? And those conversations, once I've had a lot of them, they said they tend to lend themselves to common themes. And so I kind of pick on those and, and build my story ideas from there. So a few episodes ago, we had Diana Kruzman, who's a reporter of a similar age to you, who covers both climate issues and religion. And we talked about, um, I think I called it something like immediate humanization or immediate personalization in your sto- in stories. And the idea of taking a story about a big topic, as you often write about big topics, and leading the story with people. And I noticed that in your writing, the first paragraph of almost every story is a person rather than an idea. So with that, uh, can you explain your writing process? Yeah, so I mean, I love starting with a person because that's the reason I care about any story, right? Like it's the reason I would care about a policy or a statistic or other big idea because it affects a person. It's almost going back to what I was saying, you know, at the Texas Tribune, why I got interested in health reporting in the first place. It was because I was able to see that connection between this policy or legislation or political stuff and a person in their home, in their living room, in their school. And so that's why that's important to me. And that's also how a lot of my stories start, as I just said, you know, in in speaking to folks. So sometimes a story starts with a person's individual experience. For example, I did a recent story about how insurance plans sometimes make it difficult for people to get mental health care from their primary care doctor. And the story started with an email listserv that primary care doctors were chatting back and forth and someone shared with me and you know, had a particular example of a patient who had gone in to see their primary care doctor for, you know, physical health reasons and then started talking about anxiety. And then their insurance company wouldn't pay for that visit because it was considered a mental health visit. And it turned out, you know, there's a specifics on their insurance plan that, that were, that was really confusing to the patient. But essentially I started with that one individual and then try to back out and say, does that actually happen or often, or is it a one-off? Because I generally don't want to cover something that is, that is, you know, just a fluke. And so generally what I do is when I have that individual person or story, I then try to do interviews with associations. So in this case, associations representing primary care doctors to see if they'd heard about this, mental health advocacy groups to see if other patients had been hit with these kinds of bills or insurance denials. I also, because I'm in health reporting, a lot of times there are research studies. So I I go to, you know, Google Scholar and and put in the keywords and try to see if there are research studies on the topic and and talk to those academic or policy research folks about why is this happening? How does it happen? How often does it happen? What solutions have been tried? And then essentially I compile all of that into a (laughs) Google Doc and my Google Docs tend to range like 40 to 50 pages with all my notes. And then I sit down to write the story and I always do an outline and I structure and restructure my article a bunch of times, but always trying to bring it back to the average person and why why whatever big idea I'm writing about affects them because that's why I care and I think that's why a lot of readers care. I appreciate the detective work that you described. (laughs) I appreciate the scholarly approach too. Certainly you learn, you know, something like outlining at a in a high school college classroom and it's great to see it applied into real life related reporting. So you're doing a lot of work in coverage related to mental health and that includes covering the subject of suicide as a public health issue. And I'm reading from something you wrote last November, what happens after a campus suicide is a form of prevention too, where you explain postvention. Another piece I saw was on the growing suicide crisis for communities of color. And the story that you shared that 
from a story that you did last April about addiction treatment providers in Pennsylvania it began with the story of a suicide that was part of a huge Kaiser PA spotlight project about facilities that were operating with little oversight. You've also reported for WHYY, a report on why Latina teens have attempted suicide. Why does this subject in particular appeal to you? So this is a topic I got interested in when I was in college. Someone very close to me was dealing with depression and suicidal ideation at the time. And I always like to practice the story with that person is doing fine now. But it was it was really a difficult time and I was very unequipped to handle it. I didn't personally know what to do when we tried to access resources, you know, campus counseling, even you know, counseling outside of that in Boston. It was really difficult. And so it kind of made me wonder, you know, is it just me? Is it just our campus? And so I started reporting on college mental health, you know, first in Boston at my own school. And then when I was doing internships, I did it in, in Texas and a few other places. And really, it's just grown from there. It started with college mental health and then has become mental health more broadly and then became mental health and substance use. And it's just seeing how many people are affected by these issues, but don't necessarily know how to talk about it or are not seeing that conversation happen widely has really driven me to want to do more reporting on this. And I think now with, with COVID, it has become a wider conversation and I feel like more people are interested in the stuff I'm reporting on, which is great. It's great to see that conversation be more widespread. Is there a story that you've done where you, I mean, you've done a lot, a lot of pieces on this subject where you learned something that was, that was kind of particularly important that I'm, I'm presuming most things fit under this, but that was particularly important that you've ca- kind of carried through to the other reporting that you've done? So I don't know if this is, I can't pinpoint a story where I learned this, but particularly when I first started reporting on suicide, I didn't, I had, you know, that sort of personal experience of, of someone close to me, but I didn't know a lot about it. And so a lot of the basic things that I learned along the way have, have stuck with me and come up time and again the fact that suicide is preventable, the fact that it's influenced by mental illness, but that's not the only driver and not everyone who tries to kill themselves has a mental illness, that there are um, other factors that are really important like economics and housing security and your sense of belonging and place in the world. And also the fact that suicide is impulsive. So things that delay someone's death even a little bit, things like a lock on a safe that stores a gun or that stores prescription pills, even though that's not forever delaying someone accessing those those items, even a small delay can be enough to make someone pause and rethink. So just all those little things I think have affected how I think about suicide, understanding why it's more of a public health issue and not just a one-off and also realizing it's more common than we realize. You've also taken this a step further in that you've created a course on Coursera, a learning platform, on responsible reporting on suicide for journalists. Can you explain what that is and how to access it? Yeah, so this is a free course that is hosted online on Coursera. As you mentioned, it's called Responsible Reporting on Suicide for Journalists. And so folks can search that on Coursera or go to the short URL is bit.ly slash report on suicide. And essentially, let me back up here. The, one of the other things I've learned in reporting on suicide is that there's actually a whole body of research, like hundreds of studies over decades that show certain types of news stories about suicide can contribute to more subsequent suicide deaths. And it's called suicide contagion. And at the same time, there are other reporting practices that can encourage people to seek help. So the whole idea of creating this course was to help people learn how to do more of those helpful practices and make them aware of what some of the concerning practices might be. And this is something that I really learned on the job, like trial and error. I I wrote some stories and got calls from from advocates and researchers in this field. So the hope is, you know, now this course is free and it's online and can, you know, people can take it at their own time. So hopefully, you know, working journalists, journalism students, can take it and kind of, when they come across suicide stories, be prepared to handle them, whether that's, you know, 
I covered my first story about suicide when I was on a crime and general assignment beat. I know people cover it in education, in lifestyle, celebrity coverage, in health news. So hopefully this will be helpful to folks in those areas. So there are two things that I know that you've talked about, written about with regards to this that you, I think you talk about in this course. One is just the idea that most stories, something in them near the end that says, if you are thinking about, if you are dealing with mental health issues, here's phone numbers and links to places where you can go. And something as subtle as moving that up and putting that at the top of the story or in kind of like a sidebar, if if you were thinking of a newspaper, that something like that's important, right? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of folks, I think, have gotten onto, you know, including the helpline numbers in their stories, but also, you know, as a reporter, a lot of places, a lot of newsrooms I've worked in will have, you know, analytics that track how far into our story someone scrolls on a, on the website until they leave. And I think any reporter who's seen that, most people don't make it to the end of our stories. So if we're putting that helpline at the bottom of the article, a lot of people won't make it there. And particularly that number is there for folks who are vulnerable, who might already be thinking about suicide. And when they read a story, you know, that they identify with the person who died by suicide, or it has some specifics about how the person killed themselves, that information might be just enough to push them to act. You want to have that number high up so that even if they don't make it through the whole story, maybe that number is that, you know, one thing that, as I said, suicide is impulsive. Maybe that number is the one thing that stops the person. They, they make the call and it, and it gives them enough time to decide not to act on their impulse. Pause, pausing here for one second. I was thinking that I might need to put disclaimer of sorts at the start of the episode. Is there a wording in particular that would be effective that I should use? Yeah, there's not a lot of great research on this in terms of what's most effective. I generally right. go with something like, you know, this this podcast will, you know, discusses the topic of suicide. If you or anyone you know has thoughts of suicide, like please know help is available call 1-800-273-TALK. You should double check that because I'm yep. obviously pulling that off the top of my head or text no, yep. 741741. But that, right. that's generally the language I go with, but okay. there's not a, a good research on like, that, what's better. Uh, that is what I'll do because I was I was thinking about that because mm-hmm. I, I have, I was thinking about like even how I'm going to promote this episode on Facebook uh, or mm-hmm. you know Twitter because I know I have friends that have dealt with it within their family. And these are people that, interact with my content often. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about handling that. Getting back to to this, so wording nuance is also important, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think wording seems small, but it's so important because it shapes our perspective. So one of the things that comes up really frequently, and one of the things that I got called out on when I started reporting in this area, was saying someone committed suicide. And the reason that's changing is that wording committed is something we say when someone commits a crime or commits a sin, which is how suicide has been looked at a lot throughout history. Uh, So instead, there's a push to say someone died by suicide, because that's the same way we would say someone died of cancer. So framing it as an illness, as a health issue, rather than a crime or a sin. And that's just one of those small language tweaks that can change our perspective. Has reporting on mental health and mental health issues made you aware of your own mental health and taking care of yourself? Yeah, absolutely. As I said, my interest in this area came from, you know, a personal experience. And I think, frankly, I think that's true of a lot of folks who work in mental health, whether that's journalism or other fields touching mental health. But so sometimes when I report on these issues, it it does bring bring me back to that time in my life and, and you know, worrying about the the people around me and things that were going on. So sometimes I have to step back and say, you know, I did one story on suicide. I need to purposely take a break and write about something else or report on something else, or, you know, just in a a day of heavy interviews, making sure that I'm uh, taking a break. And I like to do like group workout classes and something that like keeps me, keeps my mind occupied. So I can't like just obsessively think about something. So I've certainly had to find things that work for me. And I know a lot of other reporters I've spoken with who cover these topics do the same thing. Within the field of mental health reporting, what haven't you done that you'd like to do? 
I mean, I would still certainly like to do like some sort of something big that brings about emotion, enlightenment, and change the thing that's on my (laughs) website. That's still the goal. So maybe, you know, that would be an investigative series, something where I've done, you know, one-off investigative stories or some accountability stories, but I would love to do something where I get to stick with a source for a long time or sources and kind of follow up and, and be, you know, following up with folks who are supposed to be changing policies and, and seeing if that happens and if they're effective. So some sort of larger investigative work that spans a longer period of time. Okay. Is there a, is there a story that you've done that you're most proud of at this point in your career? I'm not sure if this is the story that I'm most proud of out of you know everything that I've written, but one recently that really stuck with me and that I felt like I learned a lot and was really proud to put out there was actually a story you referenced earlier about uh, the increase in suicide among communities of color. And it was really talking about, you know, with, with COVID-19, there was a lot of concern about suicide rates going up, the mental health impact of it. And so in 2021, when the CDC like put out some suicide data and it, sh- it showed that in the past year, the suicide rate actually went down, people were really relieved. But when you actually like broke down that information by race and ethnicity, it showed the same thing that happened the year before, which is that the suicide rate had gone down for white Americans, but not for Black Americans, Native Americans, or Hispanic Americans, and in some states, Asian Americans as well. And so I really got to kind of just take that one, that one disparity and dive into it and, and talk to a lot of suicide researchers who's been, who have been looking at this for decades. Like this, the suicide rate among communities of color has been growing for decades and has been increasing particularly among young people. And what I liked was not just finding that disparity, but being able to talk about, well, what are the solutions then? And the solutions are these like wider scale public health things. Yes, it's, you know, people should have access to mental health counseling and services, but also like the reason these rates are climbing among people of color have to do with, you know, access to good jobs, access to good schooling, these like larger public health issues. And so I really, as I said, I learned a lot by reporting on that. And I felt like I was able to contribute to a conversation that I wasn't seeing happening widely. So I was really proud to do that. That sounds like you've definitely touched on the enlightenment aspect of things with with regards to that piece. For the young journalist out there that sees what you've done and says, I want to have a career that's headed in the direction that hers is, what advice would you have for them? I think don't be afraid to aim high and try for everything. Doesn't mean you'll get it and doesn't mean I've gotten everything that I tried for, but I think always aiming high like has helped me. So for example, when I was applying for my first full-time job, I, you know, I I think I applied for 50 positions or something. And most of them were, you know, general assignment jobs, small town papers, things that I was definitely, you know, more qualified for. But I also saw like an investigative position at one, it was a relatively small paper somewhere in Wisconsin. And I was like, you know what, I would love to be doing investigative reporting. And I applied, even though, you know, it would be my first full-time job, I'd done internships, but still. And the editor called me for an interview for that position. And he literally asked me, you know, why did you apply for this as someone so young? Like, did you really think you were qualified? And I told him, you know, I knew it was a long shot, but I approached applying for jobs and thinking about my career the same way that I try to approach reporting stories. And it's, even if I think a source is not going to answer this call, I still make the call because what if they do answer? And what if that is the greatest interview or that is the breakthrough? And so I, I kind of give that same advice to younger journalists. Like, if even if you don't think it's possible, aim for it, try. It may not happen, but what if it does? How did it work with the editor in Wisconsin? It went well. So I got a, a second interview and then I did not make it past that. But I, I made a good connection and I, you know, practice my interviewing skills. Sure. And you also, you have, you've had 18 successes you can build upon. Now we should know too, that in addition to work, you're an active volunteer and you've done two volunteer things that I wanted to ask about. We always make sure when someone uh, 
mentions that they're volunteering for a journalism organization to bring that up. You you mentor for the Asian American Journalists Association. What does that entail and what kind of things do you teach people? So I got matched up with a young journalist who's also in the Asian American Journalists Association. She had just graduated from college when we were first matched. And essentially the mentorship program that AAJA was running was was to help the mentee with whatever they want. And so in my case, my mentee was applying to jobs for the first time. So, you know, I helped her draft cover letters. I, you know, talked about how you send those awkward networking emails where you want to ask someone to refer you to a job, but you don't want to come off like you're asking for too much. I helped her with like negotiating when she got an offer. We talked about how to find friends when you move to a new city just for that journalism job and don't know anyone. So it's, at least my mentoring experience has been very freeform and just kind of whatever comes up in her life I get to help with. But I really like doing that because I've had a lot of journalists do that for me. So it's nice to be able to do that for someone else too. So the other thing that uh, mentoring that you did that is impressive to me, it was a program from Paper Airplanes where you mentored two Syrian students uh, remotely, helping them with assignments and getting them to tell their story about living through the Syrian civil war. What was that like? It was really educational for me. So, you know, certainly I was, I was trying to help them in brainstorming story ideas and understanding how to do an interview and write. But really the best part was hearing from them, you know, what life was like, what issues were important to them, what did they want the world to know about, about the situation that they were living through. So, you know, one student was living in a city that was outside of the, the fighting area in Syria, but they were getting a lot of in-country refugees. And so she wanted to write about the response to them and what her city was doing to accept them and what things it was not doing or not providing. And so it was really great just, just learning so much from them and also you know, thinking a little more deeply about what like citizen journalism means. I don't think I had thought about it so much, but these are people who, students who were writing about issues that hit very, very close to home, that they did have, you know, an opinion and a view on. And we had a lot of conversations about, well, how much of that opinion should, if any, should be in the article? And, you know, how do we pick our story ideas and frame them? So it was just, it was really educational for me, frankly. That sounds very very rewarding, certainly from both sides. And then one other thing, why grad school? So I never, so throughout my entire undergrad experience, I took, I did not take a single health or science course. I came into college with some AP chemistry credits and I didn't need it because I was majoring in journalism. And it wasn't until my very last semester that I decided I wanted to go into health reporting. So I've just been learning on the job, which I love. And again, journalism, student for life, like that, that's the best part of this job, in my opinion. Um, But I wanted to get a more foundational understanding. I wanted to have the formal teaching. And if it hasn't come across already, I'm a huge nerd. And so I decided I wanted to go back to school for public health. So you're doing this remotely? Yes. So I'm doing it remotely. I you know, quote unquote, attend Johns Hopkins, but have never set foot on the campus, which is weird, but hopefully that will change soon. It's, it, I wish I was going back full time, but it's easiest this way to, you know, keep working and do, do the reporting I get to do in North Carolina while learning online. The last question always relates back to the title of the show, The Journalism Salute. We salute you for the good work that you've done. Now we ask you to pay it forward. Is there a journalist or journalism organization that you're not affiliated with that you would like to salute for their good work? Yeah, so there's like a bunch of reporters doing amazing reporting, particularly on mental health, which is the area that I'm always interested to see other people's work in. But one person who comes to mind is Ritu Chatterjee at NPR. She covers a lot of mental health for kids and families. And I, I just really love the sort of the, the nuance and the sensitivity, like the care she brings to that reporting and looking at it with like, what are the underlying causes and like, what are the different issues that touch on mental health? It's not in a silo. And I think she does a really good job of 
being a human in addition to being a reporter, which is something I always strive to do and strive to remind myself. So it's nice when I see other people do that. Aniri Patani, thank you for taking the time to join us. Best of luck in, in your future work. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. Please let us know what you think of the show. You can find us on Twitter at JournalismPod, and you can email us at JournalismSalute at gmail.com.